<laughs> oh. Okay, so before we talked about, yesterday we definitely, we definitely defined all the different variables that gases are affected by. We know that a gas has no finite volume. It can be affected by how fast a particle moves, it can be affected by the pressure on it, and the space in which it flies in, and of course, how many of the particles all affect uh, the variables that will make a gas act differently in different conditions. So we've developed our essentially PV equals NRT formula, which everything really um, goes through in terms of understanding all the variables that affect how a gas behaves. Now, we'll talk later about why they call it the ideal formula. Right now, I call it the static formula. And then we basically converted that into PV over T, which we use mostly in the regents level. They don't use this, OK? This is the current condition. This is a new condition. But we understand that moles are being constant. Everything we did there. In fact, tomorrow we're going to have a quiz what? on the derivation of this which I have posted, I'm leaving a blank piece of paper, and the derivation I'll do next period, where we're gonna manipulate this even more. Mm -hmm. But before we can get to a laboratory technique, we have to really start talking about where the measurement of pressure started from, where the units came from. I can't talk about pressure unless I talk about where the units first were born. So, <coughs> Evangelista Torricelli, okay, look how early that was. He was the first to start measuring pressure. Now, he certainly wasn't after measuring pressure. He was actually trying to solve a problem. And through problem solving, he essentially, without thinking about it, was the first to create the first barometer, which was a measurement of the particles of a gas in the air and how much force they apply over an area. Can't say enough. Pressure, we think all the time as a force, but it's a force over an area, or meter squared, or some unit squared. <coughs> so the idea is, if you put me in um, high heels in a snowstorm or a big snow, I would definitely sink into the snow because all of my force of my weight, weight is basically mass times acceleration of a gravity, so all my force due to my weight <coughs> would push through the little tiny heels and I would go into the snow. But if you were to put snowshoes on me or these tennis rackets and you would distribute all of my force over a bigger area, okay, I could walk on the snow, okay? So that's something to think about. It's a force over an area. It's a ratio of the force. It's not total force. So as we go through this first period, understanding where the units come from, think of pressure as a ratio of the force of particles, okay, colliding over an area. If the area is bigger, you'll get more force overall, but the ratio of force per area stays constant in a scenario like that. So what was the problem that Torricelli was trying to solve? Okay, well, what he was trying to solve was that there was a great pump of Leonardo da Vinci that was built for the Grand Duke of Tuscany. So this was a device that was uh, essentially used to help bring water out of a well. So where you have artesian wells, the wells of water that weren't that deep, basically what you could do, you've seen them in the movies where You've had these little stone round objects and people had pails and going down. So there's plenty of places where there was fresh water not too far down. So this is an example where they had a pump okay, designed by Leonardo da Vinci. And very simply, it works by having a, um, um, a, a cylinder. okay, And in this cylinder, um, they create something called a partial vacuum. And let me try to explain this for you because this is the problem that Torricelli was trying to answer, and it has everything to do with a measurement of pressure. So what you had is you had this well, okay? And so this is inside, it's an aquifer that kind of keeps going, so to speak. And then we have some intrusion that goes down, okay? And the pump basically works by having some kind of sealed disc or container, and then you have this holder. So this is basically a big piston that comes down and up. Okay, now, uh, in our, I'll just draw it this way, we have a spout that comes this way, okay, and then we have some sort of uh, mechanical lever, okay, that helps us do this. Now, when you think about it, what I'm going to do is 
is I pull the pump up, and you've seen probably these old-fashioned pumps. You pull the pump up, okay, what's going to happen is this winds up going where? Yeah. So as you pull up, this goes upward, okay? Or does it? Okay? Think of the, I think as you go up, it goes downward. Yeah, I think as you go up, it goes downward. Okay, so this goes up, this moves downward. Okay, now, of course, what we have here is water up to this line. Okay, so you've got water in this little tube. So this little area of air, okay, is kind of like in its own spot. Now, understand, in the, in, in the well, you have gas molecules that are applying an atmospheric pressure in all direction. All the little air molecules that are in the aquifer above the water level are pushing in all directions, are creating a pressure. And by the way, this pressure is probably somewhat equal to the atmospheric pressure. I would say it's very close. Okay, now, so as you pull up, this comes down, okay? Okay, so we make the space smaller, so we probably uh, make the space a little bit smaller, and this comes down. Maybe some air gets pushed out, but not too much. Here's the thing. When you <coughs> raise this up, as Josh Grove would say, all right, and you're in this position. Now, here's where it happens. So you pull the pump up, okay, and now when you push down, that's when the water comes out. So by pushing down, what happens to the, um, that little disc? It goes up. Goes up. Now, as it goes up, what you're doing is creating a bigger space. We learned yesterday that volume is proportionate to 1 over P. What does that mean? As the volume space of a gas gets bigger, the pressure must get what? Decrease. Must decrease. If you're going to give molecules of gas at the same temperature, okay, a bigger space to fly in, the amount of collisions has to be less. That's Boyle's law. Okay, Robert Boyle. We talked about him. Now, as the pressure drops, so we're creating a low pressure system right here. Well, the pressure that's already existing, the air pressure already existing in the aquifer is now what? Can, is now higher and water gets pushed up this tube and out of the well. What you created was a vacuum or a partial vacuum. That's all you did, okay? You lift it up, okay? It goes down, you, pull, you push down, and by pushing down, you're creating bigger space that creates a lower pressure and it's actually the pressure of the atmosphere that pushes it up, supports a column of liquid upward, and that's how the well worked. Now, they didn't know exactly how it worked. It just did, okay? The problem was, the, I believe the Duke of Tuscany wanted to move this well within the castle walls, okay? Now, the elevation of the castle walls was higher, which means the aquifer was going to be deeper. The problem was... When they moved the well, redug the hole, and put the same mechanical device, it wasn't working. They knew there was water there. Everything was the same, except it was just higher. The pump didn't work inside the <coughs> castle. The only difference was the well was deeper. And why wouldn't it work? If I'm sitting here, if I want more water, I do this. Now, what I keep doing is I keep creating a what? Low pressure area and atmospheric pressure keeps making the water. So your idea that you keep doing this is adding force to bring the water up when in fact this and this type of pump has no effect by how fast you make this motion this force that I'm applying isn't creating greater amounts of water all you're doing is basically creating a bigger or lower pressure area making a bigger volume so the force you apply has nothing to do you're not doing anything what's pulling the water up the atmospheric pressure in the aquifer, correct? <coughs> so Torricelli was commissioned to understand what's working here and how can I fix it? And he noticed, well, gosh darn it, it's really about fluid of water being supported. The reason why the water was going up, he thought, was because of pressure. So what he did was he created a scenario. Now he noticed something. 
Water is very light. He couldn't build a tube as tall as or as long back then for the well he was using. So he, what he did is he scaled his model down. And I used to do this demonstration years and years ago with mercury. It was really cool. And he take, so he said, well, let me use a liquid that's really, really, really dense. And maybe I can understand it using this model. Now, why did he do this? Well, mercury is 3.6. Mercury is Hg. It's 13.6 um, grams per milliliter. That's its density. The density of water is about, what's the density of water? One. About 10 gram per milliliter at 4 degrees. So we know that mercury is 13.6 grams per milliliter more dense, or 13.6 times more dense. Think about this. His idea was that what was bringing the water up was atmospheric pressure, that water could the atmospheric pressure could support a certain amount of water. <coughs> he couldn't build this model, so he said, what if I make the liquid being supported 13.6 times more heavier? Then I could see, then I could be a smaller model, correct? So what he did was he used mercury. And what he did was he took a vat of mercury, basically a big container, took a long tube, didn't need the 40 feet that was in the well, because he couldn't build, but he could but he built a container about, about yay big. Basically, it was a big tube on top, put a thumb over it, filled it all the way up with mercury, so he took a tube that was about three feet or so, filled it with mercury. This was filled with mercury. Inverted it. Then he suspended it in the mercury dish. And interesting enough, the fluid moved down. The fluid moved down until it rested at a certain position. And he said to himself is, why can only that much mercury be supported? Again, he couldn't build 40 feet of water. He figured if I use something really, really dense, I could use some math to make an, an equivalent, um, an, uh, make an equation or somehow make a model that represents a relationship, which we'll talk about. So he noticed the mercury dropped all the way down. If I take a tube of water, fill it all the way up and invert it, it doesn't drop. Why? Right. I mean, if I take, and I'll just show you, I mean, you, you probably have seen this, it's no biggie, but <coughs> if I take a, a udiometer, Okay, and all I'm going to do is put some water. Okay, so all I've got is a cup of water, no biggie, or a cup from 7-Eleven. Why, why do you have so many of them? Because I, For stuff like this? Yeah. But I'm going to use them or reuse them to, uh, to plant the, the flowers. Flowers? Oh, the things that we planted last year. So, um, yeah, so I got my thumb. I, it's not perfect, it's a little space here. But I filled this udiometer tube up with water. Okay, in fact, let's top it off. Why not? Okay? Okay, top it off now. I topped it off. You can see the bead, right? Okay, now, I put my thumb on it, and now I'm going to invert it. Stick my thumb in here, and the water didn't drop. Because what's keeping the water up? The atmospheric pressure is hitting the liquid and keeping the water supported. But if this was mercury, if this was mercury, okay, it would drop down to something like that. Because the mercury being so heavy, the atmospheric pressure couldn't support it, which made him think there's a limit to how much a fluid atmospheric pressure can what? Support in a column. I don't know if you can see that, but there's the top right there. And so what he did was he basically made the first barometer. And with mercury, he measured, oops, he me a little more of adjustment here. He measured the distance from the level to the height of the column and said atmospheric pressure is supporting that much mercury. 
and that was the first barometer. That was the first measurement of pressure. Now, it later became, because meters weren't used until <laughs> 1700, okay? That's funny. No, I, was like, I was too close. I was too close. I was too close. <laughs> but um, it wasn't until the 1700s or 1800s after the, um, the French Revolution that they adopt the meter, and that distance, okay, let me explain. That distance between the level and the height of mercury supported was measured to be 760 millimeters of mercury. And that represents the height of That's liquid of mercury that's supported by the <laughs> movement of gases. Remember, gases are hitting what? The surface. the surface and causing a pressure to keep that upward. Water, as you saw, does get supported because it's so light. So he said, my gosh, there's a limit to how high, there's a limit to how high water can be supported, just like there's a limit to mercury. So here's some of the math he may have done. I don't know. So here's probably the math that we will do. Very simple, okay? If this is 760 millimeters of mercury, for mercury, all right, how many millimeters would it be for water? Wait a minute. The distance is 760 millimeters of the mercury, right? <coughs> That's the distance. And the, the density, remember, it's all about the what? The weight, the force of the liquid, because it's so heavy. That's under this much, if you want to think of it, force, 13.6 grams per milliliter. What would be the comparative height if I'm dealing with something with 1.0 grams per milliliter. Hello, mercury is 13.6 times more dense. Shouldn't the height be 13.6 times less, or 13, six, uh, divide by 13.6, you wanna say it that way? So if, I don't care if you don't like this, take your 760, well in this case, I'm sorry, if mercury is 760 millimeters of mercury high, being that dense, that's the limit to how much liquid can be supported in a column of mercury. How much would it be for water who is 13.6 less dense? 13.6 times higher. So basically, as you can see, times one, you're just going to times it. So 760 times 13.6, what we're going to get is the millimeters of what? The millimeters of water. water. <coughs> that can, that's the limit. So 760 times 13.6 gives me a total of 10.336 millimeters. And we know what? To convert millimeters to meters, and move the decimal place over three times. So it becomes 10.3 meters. My friends, in chemistry, that is the limit of how high water can be supported. In their pump, because they were only creating a vacuum in this system, they were limited by how strong the what? Atmosphere could support the liquid that high. When they moved this into a higher elevation inside the castle, they went past that limit. By the way, it's about 32 feet. That it's approximately 32 feet. Which means, yeah, go ahead, Cole. No, it doesn't. It's a great question. Does the thickness of the pipe matter? Absolutely not because pressure is a force over an area, not total force, right? So pressure is just a ratio of force. Over. So if you have a bigger column of water, you would need more total force, but the pressure would be the same because you have more what? Surface area for gases to collide on, okay? So no, that, that column can be any size. Just like, so if you're a swimmer who's swimming under 10.5, three meters or 32 feet, what do you feel? You feel cool because you're swimming. My hair gets a mess when I swim. You feel an additional atmosphere of pressure. So because of Torissa, so he figured out that you cannot use this pump system. Yes? Now that's why trees max out at like 30 feet, right? That's re one of the reasons why so many trees max out at 30 to 40 feet because to get water up, using atmospheric pressure, but you're also using some adhesive forces there. They attract to each other, cohesive Bio. adhesion, but 
The bottom line is to get the water up, atmospheric pressure is the biggest push. Absolutely. Unless they have, like the redwoods, other ways of bringing that water up. Okay, but absolutely correct. Great job there. Now, so what do we know from this? So what did he do? He says, well, we got to develop a new pump. Okay, so what he did was, he was first to help design this pump. He looks like it's a fake mustache, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Looks like a caterpillar. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> so the pump that he created, and I'll just, I don't have the actual drawing, but the reconfiguring the pump was instead of, instead of, okay, pushing down for this to go up to create a vacuum, you push down to bring atmospheric air and you bubble it into the system. So what he did was, oh. yeah, what was he doing? <laughs> what was he doing? He's, so he's, uh, he's increasing the pressure in the thing. He was how? By adding right. by adding air. Ah, what, what what was the thing that we were doing here? Okay, by somehow coming up, opening a valve, and you can make one. He was oh, he was bringing air, and when he pushed down, he was forcing the air into this system, correct? Yes. And what did we learn? Avogadro's law. Volume is proportionate to what? Moles. So if you increase the number of particles by pushing air into it, so when he pumped down, he brought extra air into this system, the pressure did what? Increased above atmospheric pressure, which means you go above the 32 feet. Okay, and that was the improvement. All right, but interesting enough, okay, even today's pumps, water pumps, they still have a limitation. Okay, these water pumps that bring air into the system can pump way over the 32 feet because they're increasing the atmospheric pressure to do so. But interesting enough, you have to be within 32 feet of the pump to make it work. What? You still have to be within 32 feet. So a... Um, What's the requirement? Right, exactly. Uh, so you have so interesting enough, we're still limited by that value. All right. So where did this take us? That's weird. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's science. <laughs> I know. I just uh, okay. Because you have to push water 32 feet. Don't you? If you're pushing against what atmosphere? If you're gonna push water 32 feet somewhere, okay. I don't care how strong your pump is. Eventually, okay, you lose its ability to go beyond that. Now, you could pump it up, but to keep the pressure going, there's another, there's another way to do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Up in here, I know. Okay. Now, what do we know in here? What do we know? It was the first unit, Torricelli, 760 millimeters of mercury became 760 tor. And it was the first unit of atmospheric pressure. Can you just make that up, Tor? Tor is for Torricelli, the guy who... Oh, of course, the goddamn master, so... What's that to say? I'll be here all day. Okay, now. What? I, I, I Torricelli, I've just been talking about him 50 no, I minutes. I know, that's what I'm saying. He named it after himself. No, I don't think he did. He had no envision of creating a unit of pressure. He was just trying to solve a problem. And someone else gave... Remember, millimeters... That's a unit of meter didn't come until after the French Revolution. Okay, so this is way after. So, so they, they, they took that value and, and made it into millimeters of mercury much later. Okay, well, now. I touched yesterday. What's that? I touched yesterday. On the French press. Oh, okay. We did it on the French press. Yeah. Now, these are equivalent to one atmosphere. So these are our first units of pressure to describe the collisions. Okay, so my friends in chemistry, I can't continue without talking about what really a barometer is. A barometer is actually something called a manometer. Okay, let me explain. A manometer. Now, if you're sexist, it's manometer. Okay? I'm okay. Man. Where's your little syringe thing? It's okay. Neither does anyone else, but it's okay. Where's your syringe? I'll get, I don't know. It's somewhere. It's right there. Oh, yeah. All right. So, my manometer. What? I know it's <laughs> okay, so a manometer just is really what a barometer was. So the barometer is the first place where we got units of pressure. 
and it solved an important question, but it's all based upon what? Supporting a column of liquid, okay, above some point. That's where this all comes from. So the pressure units came from that. Now, a manometers are used in different places all the time. We just don't see them in this form anymore. But in this case, it does fall. yeah, it does feel that way. Okay. Well, just hopefully I don't break it. Now, don't break it. Well, that's teetering, huh? Oh, uh, much better idea. Okay, I think so. Okay, now. So in my manometer, because there's chemical reactions I do on there. Sorry. Okay. Now. Right now, these levels are equal. The basics for a manometer is that you're always using one pressure to measure another. This is an open tube. So we have atmospheric pressure, okay, hitting on this tube here. And I, I know, of course, I've got air in this tube connected to the syringe. Now, just like we talked about, okay, all the factors that, that make gases behave the way they do, the number of particles, the, te the speed at which they move temperature, the space they're in volume, and the pressure they're on. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these gas molecules and I'm going to push the syringe into. I'm going to make the space smaller. That law is called Boyle's law. As the space goes down, what's going to happen to the number of collisions? Increase. Right, because it's a collision per area. I'm giving the, the, the gases. Now, what has to be constant? The temperature. The number of moles and temperature. In truth, the temperature probably is increasing a little bit as I make them go faster. But I'm making the space go smaller. So as I push down on the syringe, I have a differential of fluid being supported. So let's pretend that this is mercury. It's not, but let's pretend it's mercury. If I wanted to measure the pressure in this part of the system, I can do so by comparatively measuring the liquid being supported. This is an open tube. Let's pretend 760 is the atmospheric pressure. Okay? It isn't always. Let's pretend that it is at sea level, okay? Now, who's winning? The gas in the syringe or the open tube? The syringe is winning, okay? Winning by how much? Well, if you measure from the zero line up, let's pretend that's 20 millimeters of mercury. I know it's not, but let's pretend it is. So if 760 is pushing down, and this is winning, this gas is winning. Not only is it pushing on 760, it's also supporting 20 millimeters of mercury. What's the pressure? 780. Because 760 plus 20, it's winning by what? 20. So I'm able to measure this pressure by comparatively seeing how much liquid I'm supporting against this pressure. Think about it again. When I was equal, they're both under the same pressure. When I make the space smaller and increase the pressure, okay, now I pushed back against 760, didn't I? And I supported 20 millimeters of mercury. Isn't that a pressure? So therefore, boom, okay, 20 plus 760 uh, is 780. I do the opposite. Let's make it equal. If I make the space bigger, obviously, the pressure decreases because the molecules will collide with the container, or at least the top of the liquid, less. So pull back on the syringe. Okay, now, what would be the pressure? Let's pretend 760 is pushing down, and this is still 20 millimeters of mercury. This is losing by 20 millimeters of mercury, so it's 720. 740, right? But yeah. isn't that a, that's not a vacuum, is it? No, it's not a vacuum. And I'll explain a manometer with, I'll explain the barometer, manometer kind of thing in a second. So my friends in chemistry, we use manometers all the time. So in this case, and think of it this way, not only is the atmosphere winning and pushing back on this gas, it's also supporting 20 millimeters of mercury. That's why it has to be 20 millimeters of mercury higher in pressure than this gas. And that's how we use manometers. Let me say, well, I don't see these often in my life. It's because they're hidden. They don't all look like this. Okay? For instance, you may have taken your blood pressure. Okay? You may have taken your blood pressure in a doctor's office. Okay? So what we have is a pressure cuff. Now, this 
is a gauge. In this gauge, it measures the pressure of air in this cuff. So obviously what you do, because I'm not going to tell, show you the first time. Yeah, they have like braces. Yeah, oh, they, 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 this is, yeah, this is older. But th basically, you're going to wrap this around and make a cuff, okay? And you put it on tight. No, I'm not going to do it. So <laughs> basically, wrap it around, you make a cuff. And then what you do is you put air. As you increase N, what happens to the volume? Increase Add more molecules. Okay? The volume increases, and eventually, the space increases and encroaches on my arm until my brachial artery is collapsed. And now the blood has stopped flowing to my hand. It's uncomfortable. But this is the manometer. What's a manometer? A comparative device. So what the doctor does is he over pumps up the cuff to, to make sure the pressure collapses your brachial artery. And then what he does is he scoots this in, into your brachial artery and listens and then opens up the valve so the air starts rushing out, the pressure decreases, and he's looking at what this gauge reads, and he's listening for what? The point where the blood starts to what? Come back in. Come back in. So as soon as he hears the heartbeat, which is the pulse of the blood on the arterial wall, he looks to see what that needle is. He's using what? One pressure against another. He was reading the pressure of your what? This is not connected to your artery, right? But if I know when this opens up, when the pressure what? Relieves is when this pressure must equal the pressure of the wall. That's how it works. It's the same thing here. The pressure here in this equals the pressure here. So, by the way, anyone, who, anyone know what this is called? It's a blood pressure reader. But it's a more fancier name. Blood. Josie, I've got this. You know what this is, Josie. Oh, come on. This is, this, is the one, this is where you jump in. This is where you stop watching the music videos and jump in. I'm not watching the music videos. Okay. <laughs> a sphygmomanometer. You know what? I need that. Fake. No, a sphygmomanometer. <laughs> hey, it's a manometer. Why is it a manometer? Because it's measuring a comparative pressure of one against the other. Another type of device that may be funny to you is this. It's a gauge, and you see these gauges all the time. Okay? How do they work? It's so interesting. This, this measures the pressure. Now, how does it work? Just give me two seconds. It works because in the back, there's a copper coil. Okay, I've taken the back off. For those that can't see, open your eyes. But you can see there's a copper coil right there. And what's really cool about that is it's got a shape. What? Okay? No, it's got a shape. It's bent. Just like what? This is bent. So it's a copper tube that's been flattened. If the pressure increases... Move this way. It doesn't make a noise. No, but what's happening when I add molecules into here. It straightens what? It straightens out. The shape changes as I add what? As I add gas molecules. So party people, if I put, okay, same idea. If I put more gas molecules in this, what's going to happen? It's going to straighten out. It's going to straighten out. You see it moving? Yep. And all they do is they, they put a spring onto it to make it move. And that's what's moving. Moving that by adding gas molecules is what moves the little gauge. We call this gauge pressure because we're just measuring the extra pressure above what? Atmosphere. Atmosphere. OK? All right. So taking out our manometer form for a second. So let's take out our manometer. Let's go through the manometer problems. Very important to understand, manometer problems have everything to do with what we're talking about. So, party people, okay, let's go to that worksheet that I asked you to take out. Here we go. Boom, let's look at these guys right here. Okay, I'm going to take this down before I break it. All right, I will give you a little break, but not right now. I want to finish this point. Okay, where did I do with the uh, my pad? Nope. I had a pad somewhere. It's right there.
So what is this quiz going to be? Helpful. I'll explain. Okay. Next period. Oh now I need my writer. Uh oh, you lose. It's right there. I see it. Oh, you're the best, man. The twins see it. Whoa, I saw it first. Oh, jeez. A bender war starts. Oh my God! Clearly, Chris said it first. I didn't say it first. You couldn't see it. I saw it. All right, here we go. Christmas in July. Now, let's. Who's winning? Who's winning? Who's winning? That one. The atmosphere. The atmosphere. Let's pretend it's 760. Pushing down. It's winning by how much? 52. Right, but remember, the unit is 760 millimeters of what? We gotta convert. Right, so isn't a millimeter 10 times a centimeter? Yeah. So isn't this really 520 millimeters? Yep. So wait a minute, the height is 520. So it's winning by 520, the gas must, so what's the gas pressure? Yeah, so it's 760 minus 520. I think a 240 wow, is a so good thing. So the gas is pressure using another what? Value of pressure based on the support of a liquid. That's a manometer. So who's winning now? The, the, the who's winning? The gas. The gas by how much? By seven millimeters. Now we're, we're pretending this is what? Mercury. So it's winning. We're pretending a 760 is pushing down. So this gas is not only what? It's not only pushing back the atmospheric pressure, it's... Adding some. It's adding some. It's, no, think of it this way. Not only is it pushing atmospheric pressure back, it's also supporting that amount. So therefore, that pressure has to be extra. 827. 827 sounds good to me. You're just adding it. And here, looky here, this... It's closed. It's closed. Now, let me, let me explain this. It's, it's very closed. important. <coughs> very important. Oh, no. It's not an atmosphere. Mercury, which we're assuming in the tube. If not, we're going to have to go to mercury, 13.6 to water. Barely, barely, barely evaporates. In fact, it's vapor pressure. The rate of evaporation is like 0. 0.0001. So because mercury is pretty heavy and it doesn't evaporate, this is essentially a vacuum. There's no air in here. So there's no competing what? Pressure. Right. Remember, over here, the gas was winning by what? It was pushing back atmospheric air and supporting the liquid. That's why you added, right? Here, it's only pushing up what? The weight of the liquid and no air. So what is the pressure? 10.3. Centimeters of mercury. Remember, make it to millimeters of mercury. 103. 103 and call it a tour, right? So this is a what? A closed tube with mercury is what? Yeah. What's that? It's like a closed tube. It's a closed tube. A vacuum. A vacuum. Gotcha. A vacuum. It's a vacuum. If I have a closed tube with mercury, what is it? What you, a barometer. A barometer. A, a manometer with a closed end with no other gas is a barometer. That's what a barometer, it's a manometer. That's the link, okay? And the key here is that mercury does not produce any vapor pressure. It doesn't evaporate into a gas. So this isn't an added value. So the reason why this dropped, there's no gas here to push down, okay? So this gas pushed up this amount of mercury. It's all about supporting the mercury in a fluid. Great job, take your break. What's that? Because the mercury is terrible at evaporating. So therefore, it was, think of it, think of it this way. When I made the barometer with Torricelli's, he filled the tube all the way up. When he inverted it, some came down, so there's no air. Okay. Can you play with your little sphincter mom? What?